typically that's a really, really, really good situation to be in where you see that, you can usually run a mile with those fish, okay? So those fish are aggressive, they want to play ball. And so, you know, again, you know, sometimes you can almost manipulate that, that attitude adjustment, I guess, by sticking a fish, cranking up one or two cranks and just letting it dig. Just letting it, you know, just like pull in a circle over the hole and just watch how the rest of those fish respond. If two or three fish shoot up and join them right away, rip that fish up and get it right back down and usually you can catch those fish that came up to join that fighting fish. You can, usually you can catch those fish before you close the bait. I mean, it's just boom, boom, boom. And it's just trying to maximize your windows. Now, the deeper fish get, the harder they can be to catch, okay? And so you look at perch, um, one thing that I've noticed is that as a general thumb, you know, you get that thump on your line, whether it's a spring bobber, whether it's a graphite rod, whatever, you get the bite, okay? Typically what that is is when a fish grabs onto the jig and it pushes forward, it's the coral thing. And you can watch it on the camera, you can watch it when you're sight fishing. If it sucks in the bait, then they coast, okay? So if they've got a bunch of fish around them and they don't want to give up their meal, they coast a little harder. So a lot of times you can get them a really hot core of bites, you know, there's a pack of fish. That's what's happening, they're sucking it and they're going. They're not going to stick around because otherwise the other fish are going to try to pull it away and take it from them, okay? On the flip side, you get a really tough bite and you, and you don't have that competition factor, the tough fish come in one at a time, they just suck onto it and they just sit, okay? And those bites can be a lot harder to distinguish. A lot of times when you have uh, a fish that just does that, there isn't the bite that you envision it being. A lot of times it's when you, you're just vibrating the rod tip, it'll either lift up or come down, and there's just something there. Okay, so most fish just grab onto it and sit. Those fish can be a lot harder to, to uh, distinguish. And the deeper the water gets, the more that's the case. Just think about this. A lot of times at home on Devil's Lake, you might be fishing 40, 50 feet of water. And so think about that when 50 feet of water, fish grabs onto it, Close forward six inches, eight inches. A lot of times you can barely, barely distinguish it. And no matter what kind of rod tip you're using, even no matter what kind of line you're using. Okay. And so the deeper the water is, the harder it is, and you know, the more diligent you have to be watching that rod tip and realize that a lot of times, if you even imagine a bite, set the hook. You know, the setting of the hook is free. Okay. Shallower water it gets a lot easier. You know, five, six, seven, eight feet of water. I mean, that's you know, much easier to distinguish the bites versus 45 feet of water. And so a lot of times in deeper water, what we'll do is we'll use a lot of dropper rigs. Now this here is just a pinhead mill, okay? That's made by Clam Pro Attack. Well, it is just a heavy cylindrical spoon that drops in the water fast. It does nothing fancy, okay? And typically what I'll do is I'll take this bottom treble hook off and I'll just tie a dropper, I'll say, four or five inches, which is either a plain hook or just a tiny little uh, tungsten jig. It doesn't even have to be tungsten, just any type of a jig with a good hook, and that way that can dangle. And so basically, you can envision this bigger spoon as your delivery system, okay, to get down into, say, 20 feet of water, get down into 50 feet of water. You don't want to be sitting there taking all day, because we just talked about perch having attention deficit disorder, and you have to get right back down on them once you catch a fish. And so this is your bait delivery where it drops down to the bottom quickly, very quickly, but at the same time when you get down there, it's got something small and delicate enough on the eat. Okay, sometimes you'll get an eat that's bigger stuff, but usually, you know, a lot of times they're a little bit more fussy than that. Okay, so, so you're talking about tying like a monofilament or something on the bottom yep. of that, which is what you're saying with the hook on that monofilament? Yes, either that or even using a chain, you know, just a, you know, the clam also makes what's called a speed spoon, which comes with the chain, or you can buy the chain separately. Haley also makes them, so a gold chain. And I find that a lot of times the chain even works better than monofilament, because at least if you have a little bit of flash, the action is a little bit more delicate, where monofilament gets kind of stiff, or just kind of swinging a little bit. So okay. Both, they both work really okay. well, but just putting a drop of a little spoon, and just using that spoon just to get down fast. Okay. So that can be really, really effective, uh, especially for deep water fish. And the other thing I like to do too is, is use, you know, even spoons, lures that uh, a lot of times people would use the water to do clam rattle and blade spoon. So what I like to do on these, I trim the feathers down with, I leave the feathers long a lot of times I'm fishing for walleyes. When I'm fishing for perch, a lot of times I'll trim those feathers down as I have a smaller compact trouble hook for them to try to hit, but it doesn't seem like they miss it as much. But, um, a lot of 
lot of you know, a lot of perch fishing is finding. I mean, ninety percent of the time, a ninety percent of the lake is finding. And so, you know, use you know even air on the side of large. Use profiles. Use lures. They, they can drop fast and cover water. And enable you to to eliminate sample a lot of water, but also have a profile and move enough water, have enough flash, where the fish can also find you. Half the battle is finding fish. You and usually the people that find fish are going to catch the most fish. On the flip side, be able to recognize situations where, yeah, finding them is in half the battle is catching them. These fish are so well fed. And you know, like Dave was talking, I don't know if most of you are here listening to Dave said, he was talking about a, you know, a lake when he was down in South Dakota where these guys are just hunkered down on a little hump and they sat there all day. They caught first, the guys that ran around didn't. That's very, very typical uh, in the eastern Dakotas when you have those high forage cycles. If you're fishing aggressively, you're not going to get that five foot fish. You're not going to get fish racing up off the bottom and chasing you down and just chomping you. You get one fish coming in at a time. And they are so fat, they are so well fed, and if anything moves or darts or whatever, they're spooky. I mean, they just don't want any type of uh, an aggressive presentation. You just got to be very subtle, very delicate. You just got to hunger down over a spot. And at that point, what's happening is since those fish are so spread out and the density is so low, you just got to be in a good enough spot where you just keep getting traffic. And so a lot of times you might have one fish come in every half hour. Okay? And you might catch, you know, maybe two fish come in every half hour. And you might catch one. Okay? But then you might have a half hour, 45 minute window for whatever reason, seven fish come in a row and eat. You know, at the end of the day, you have you've got 20 fish in your bucket. You'll be able to go out, great day of fishing. You've got a great fish, 12, 14 inch fruit, beautiful fish. Okay? And if you didn't adapt your strategy to what those fish were giving you, you're, you're not going to catch them. You're not going to catch them running around fishing really aggressively. What's amazing is you go 10 miles down the road to a different lake where you don't have such high forage cycles. And the guy that sits in one spot all day gets his clock. He isn't going really to catch him because those fish are running around and packed. And so definitely size up the ecosystem that you're fishing, size up the environment that you're fishing, and adapt to what those fish are giving you. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, trying to target big fish specifically for the big purchase men or fishing a lot of the scale for producing big fish and catching enough fish. You know, uh, you know, sometimes with other fishing, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, you know, Fish large base to target bigger fish, or you know, all these different things you hear. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these fisheries, a 14 inch perch is basically on the same program as a 10 inch perch. Just a matter of catching enough of them. And usually, the first people that are on a spot or cash in on a lake typically have the best fishing. Okay, and you'll see that a lot. I mean, you'll see that with all fish species. You ever notice, like at first, I said, first people to walk out in some of these community spots. They'll be catching, say, 12 inch crappies. Three weeks later, four weeks later, the wheelhouses come out. And guess what? Now those people are catching 11 inch crappies. Okay? And the more pressure you put on them, this fish gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? There's nothing you can do from a presentation angle that's going to change that because a big fish would hold in a bucket. The only thing you can do is find new water because typically the bigger, the bigger fish in the school are the dominant fish in the school. They're, that's the top end of the fish. They're going to eat first, and the small fish don't get to really eat or run the pack until the big fish are gone or until they're full. And so a lot of times when you pull in on a spot or a lake, the first people have the best fishing, and typically it goes downhill. And that's why it's so important to learn how to find fish, you know, learn how to, you know, to be the hunter and to, and to figure out how to, you know, how to put in the effort, how to go through that process of elimination to find your own fish. So, so how do you figure out the forage cycles? A lot of it is you just gotta you just gotta you just gotta get a feel for it. You know, just gotta and, and just it ain't gonna take you fishing that lake very long to get that feel. I mean you're gonna just from talking to people and, and um, just you know, you're not gonna be able to look it up anywhere though. You're gonna have to now, <coughs> is it, um, how is it compared to say spring, summer, fall? Is a general thumb as a general thumb on a lot of lakes, your best perch fishing is going to be in the summer of the fall. Okay? And I think the reason that is, is that the forage levels are so much higher each spring. So you have a new hatch, you've got a new wave of fresh bug hatches, fresh fish hatches, everything that's happening in that ecosystem, where the forage levels spike in the spring and early summer, and then the fish start to chop it down. 
And by July 4th or so, mid-summer on into the fall, you on a lot of lakes, you'll see that perch bite just continually get better in the later on in the summer. And that's what I attribute it to is that forage level drops off. Okay. There's some lakes where the fishing, perch fishing can be really good early summer and spring, but that's not typical. Usually on most lakes, it's a it's a fall summer bite. You'll hear people all the time start to school up for fall, whatever it is, but I think that's more to do with forage than anything. Is there a certain bottom structure you want to look for? You know, it can vary across the board. So Flats, mud, you know, soil? As a, as a general thumb, I think a lot of times we're going to find perch on flats. Because if they go, if they leave the flats, they get eaten, they get ambushed. <laughs> and so out on a flat, they're pretty sick. You know, even a 14-inch perch, I mean, it's got the height like an armadillo. That's a tough fish to tackle. You know, I mean, it's not like every walleye is going to be able to swim up and eat that. I mean, that's a mouthful, okay? But you never do it. For that fish to get to that lake, that fish has been running for its life, its entire life. Okay, so a lot of times you can't go wrong with flats. That's what can make perch fishing challenging and struggling, is it can be so random. It can be anywhere. You know, when you can look out on a flat. I mean, you wish it, there was some rhyme reason. Like on Devil's Lake, you can look at the old contours between the, the basin and the old shorelines. That that transition area is kind of your high percentage location. And, and it can be on a lot of lakes to where it's almost like what I what I envision is if you fish run across these soft basins, then they get to that transition. It's almost like a fence on a pasture where the cows get to the corner of the fence and they stop. Okay, they don't want to leave that softer bottom. But you get on some other lakes and they're not on the soft bottom. They're up on the sand. They're up there on the shallow, shallow sand. You look at Leech Lake. They might be over the car of sand flats that are five to seven feet of water. Most fish are you know chasing down younger, you know, big perch or even little perch. They're eating rusty crayfish. They're eating you know, all kinds of different things. And so the the types of locations can really vary. I mean, we've seen spots, even on Devil's Lake, you know, there's some deep boulder spots where they've got really big perch. You know, and uh, there's times on Mille Lacs where, you know, you'll find them on the sand, but you'll also find them on gravel. You know, in Lake of the Woods, you know, you'll, you'll find them on rock structure at times. And so, you know, they're just reacting and adapting their forage. There's no... You know, like those bluegills, you know, if you find the weeds, you find a certain type of height of weed with a certain contour, you're almost always going to find fish. Perch can be a little bit more random and unpredictable, and I think perch are a lot more adaptable. You know, I mean, they're just, you find them in flooded timber on some lakes that are shallow, you know, and then, you know, and then the other thing, though, getting back to the, you know, the, the tendency for perch to run flats, if they're not running flats, they're holed up in cover. Okay, and so, if they're not just, and, and typically the perch that are on flats, when they're always on the move, they're just always, seem like they're just cruising all the time. They don't ever stop moving. And, uh, you know, I've had perch in aquariums and walleyes too, and perch and walleyes don't do very well in aquariums. They're always pushing the nose against the glass. You know, they, don't, they, they just want to be moving all the time. That's just how they're built, okay? But at the same time, there's situations where I've seen perch using weeds, where they'll just hold up in a weed and they just sit in a weed bed like a bass would. You know what I mean? So if there's cover present, flooded timber, uh, you know, thick, heavy, you know, like green tail type weeds, you know, you'll see, you'll see perch hiding in the weeds, but, you know, if they're not hiding, they're cruising and they're up on those flats, you know, where they're safe. So, so if you go out on the ice, <clears throat> is it best to just like, you see a bunch of people out, some wheelhouses and this and that, sit on the edge, try to edge them or... Sometimes you can use the people that are out there to get your bearings. You know, I think you'd be a fool not to look around and see what everybody's doing. Um, you can learn a lot from watching other people. Obviously, you know, you see people that are all out drilling holes and looking. And some, you know, some of the really predominant perch fisheries, Devil's Lake, you know, Wabe, you know, some of the bigger lakes in the Dakota, you know, you have a lot of you know, people looking for perch day to day where you're going to see people fanned out and looking and drilling holes. And all of a sudden you see one guy plant. All of a sudden you see another vehicle join them pretty soon. Three vehicles turns into ten. You know something's going on. That just attracts more people. You know, and sometimes you can get on them that way. Sometimes it backfires, and if you're not the first one on them, first one finding them, it doesn't work. But typically, as a rule of thumb, you know, you gotta just you gotta drill a lot of water, drill a lot of holes, sample a lot of water. You realize too that I mean, some of the worst days I ever had as a guy were days that I had to drill 200 or more holes. Okay, some of the best days I ever had was to drill four holes. And the day before, the fish are still there. So if you have to drill too many holes, you're not fishing them, or you're moving through water, and you're not finding nothing. I mean, there's nothing slowing you down. It's like you're fishing the Dead Sea, okay? And so there's got to be some strategy with drilling a lot of holes. But typically, you know, 
you know, I tell people big moves find fish with small moves catch fish. And so space are all apart and make big moves just to sample water. Okay, because there'll be certain parts of the lake that are dead. Okay. And just sample water to see if there's signs of life. You know, and if you start to mark some fish and you start to see some activity, well slow down and, and start pulling your holes close together, making those small moves to try to really fine tune your location and really get on. I think sometimes people get too um, impatient to where they'll catch a few fish on a spot and maybe they'll make a move and they'll catch one more. And instead of moving 50 feet away or 20 feet away, because they're obviously close, right? They're catching a few, but not a lot, but there's they're obviously fish around them. Instead of making more small moves, they'll drive to the other side of the lake, okay? And think of how much time you'll burn up doing that. And so, you know, the small moves are what catch fish. And so get, drill the holes, try to find the locations where those schools are running, and then fine tune it after that. So. Any other questions at all? This is more of a like a vexler question or whatever. Is can you tell when you're looking at your vexler what kind of bottom is down there? I mean, is there a certain color or something? Sometimes it's color? relative, but what I like to do is on your vexler turn out your gain. And so turn it up. Turn it turn out well not not your gain your range I'm sorry your range. Yeah. So you got like on the FL twenty eight you've got auto range, but on the older units you've got like 20, 40, 60. Yeah, so got. say if you're in twenty feet of water, yeah. okay. Turn it up to 60. Turn up, turn your range all the way up. Okay. So then what's going to happen is on your dial, your bottom is going to go from being over here to yeah. way up here, right? Okay. Yeah. And what's going to happen is you're going to have all kinds of space below that first bottom echo. Yeah. And so look for your second, third bottom echoes. Now, if say if you're over 20 feet of water and you've got your range turned all the way up, and you've got 20 feet of water showing on your 60 on your 60 chart on your range. And it's just one signal, the first signal, just one, you're over a soft bottom. Oh, okay. okay. Now, if you get the second echo, typically there's maybe some sand, a little bit of gravel in it. If you get a third echo, typically you've got boulders. And so the more echoes you get, so people always say, oh, the harder bottom, you're going to get a, a better signal. Well, that's relevant. If I can turn my gain up and down, it's, you know, it doesn't tell you anything. Okay. You're not going to be able to tell what kind of bottom you're looking at. Unless you look at the second, third, fourth echoes. That's the easiest foolproof way to tell. Because yeah. it doesn't depend on turning your gain up and down. Yeah. So what happens is you've got to have an echo where you turn up the bottom, bounce up the bottom of the ice, go back down. It's like a ping pong ball. Okay. Soft bottoms, you absorb your signal. Hard bottoms, you get that ping pong ball effect. Okay. So that's the easiest foolproof way that I would think that's good information. Any other questions at all? Well, we won't be long. People are fishing back home right now. I've been on the boat for about a week. Yeah. And uh, I got a few more things to do before I get home. But once I get home, when it hits big, I'll be able to get fishing in pretty early. And it's going to be one of the earliest years I can remember in a long time. So Where's back home for you? Uh, Devil's Lake. Oh, you live up that way. Okay. Have you ever been big stone? Yep, I have. In fact, I just filmed a show there probably a month ago. Well, less than a month ago. That's one of the first fish in my town. Big stone. Yeah, all right. Did all right. Did all right. Yeah, that, was a few, that was a few years ago. I'm going to back for 